We are glad that you are uh, here again. Many of you, how many of you, just so Dr. Ziffer can see uh, what kind of audience he has uh, and, and knows kind of how to shape what he was talking about. How many of you were able to be here last night? Okay, so a good number, probably 80% or so. Um, so uh, most of the folks know where you're, where you're coming from. We're very honored to have Dr. Walter Ziffer and his wife, Gail. Gail, you were sitting somewhere. Oh, you've moved to the back. <laughs> Gail is way in the back. Uh, delightful uh, friends now of, of mine and, and Mercer. We're delighted that they are here. Uh, I want to make this introduction very, very brief because uh, what he usually says in an hour, he's going to have to say in 45 minutes uh, or less. And so I'm going to make this uh, extremely brief. Dr. Ziffer is a brilliant thinker, is a caring human being, is a courageous survivor of one of the world's and history's great tragedies, the Holocaust that happened almost 75 years ago. Born in Czechoslovakia, he endured seven concentration and enslavement camps has gone on to earn a number of important academic degrees, including a doctorate in theology from Strasbourg, University of Strasbourg uh, in France, of course. He's a prolific uh, writer of articles and journal entries and is also the author of two books that I want to name uh, for you this morning. The Teaching of Disdain, An Examination of Christology and New Testament Attitude Towards Jews, and most recently, the birth of Christianity from the matrix of Judaism. Last night, his talk was entitled A Witness to the Holocaust, Reminiscences from Three Years in a Human-Made Hell. Today, we shift the aperture from talking about the human-made hell to the question of where was God. The title of his talk this morning is Beyond the Odyssey in Search of God. Dr. Ziffer, you have already made good friends here, and you have warmed a place in our heart for you and for your wife, and we are delighted that you will come now and share with us uh, your reflections uh, on theodicy and beyond. If you will, welcome Dr. Ziffer with me, please. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, you may want to ask yourselves why I wear a beard. It's very important to have a beard in a situation like this because you don't see me flush after an introduction uh, as I just received. And so thank you so much for your introduction. I really appreciate it very, very much. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the Holocaust uh, was a one time in history I hope, one time in history event. And um, we, to this day, uh, 60, 70 years later, really don't know how to, how to respond to this uh, properly. Many Jewish and non-Jewish uh, historians of the Holocaust have stated that the only um, way to respond, the only adequate way to respond to the Holocaust is silence. I think Elie Wiesel said something like that a few years ago. Because human language just cannot possibly describe what happened. And I could stand here till tonight with you sitting here and give you detail after detail after detail. Uh, and still, you, I'm sure you, will not, you would not be capable of understanding what happened. Because that happening really um, explodes the, the boundaries of, uh, of reason. Uh, so I obviously cannot, uh, cannot even hope to communicate what I would like to communicate to you, uh, because there are no adequate words, adequate words for it. But on the other hand, I also feel that silence uh, does not convey uh, the, um, the immensity of uh, what happened, the immensity of the tragedy. Uh, for the sake of post-Holocaust generations, 
there must be discussion uh, because silence just will not do it. So my reason for being here and having spoken to many, many people before uh, is really my effort uh, not to let the Holocaust go into oblivion, not to let the people who died there, six million of them, uh, Jewish people, of course, and one additional million of people, non-Jewish people, who uh, resisted Hitler, uh, to let them go into oblivion. Uh, the brutality and uh, the cruelty that we experienced is truly beyond human understanding. And uh, that also applies, as many writers have pointed out, to the bestiality of many of the people who just looked on, which are usually, or who are usually called bystanders. Yes, there have been many of those. When I, after having said what I said, that all this is beyond understanding, well, I have to qualify my statement uh, in the sense that, well, perhaps we can understand it, to at least to some extent, how events of such negative magnitude can happen and, alas, do happen, still happen. On the other hand, what escapes me, or what has escaped me up to this moment in any case, as a theologian, as a biblical scholar, is um, God's silence. God's silence is uh, either ignored by a lot of people uh, when it comes to a discussion of the Holocaust. Uh, people don't want to talk about it. And when they talk about it, they usually involve something called theodicy that Dr. McMahon mentioned. The word theodicy is not the odyssey. That's something else. But theodicy is based on two Greek words, theos, which is God, and DK, which is justice in Greek. So theodicy is, some, uh, is a concept that uh, sort of conveys or tries to convey uh, a reconciliation between the existence of evil and uh, the alleged goodness and the sovereignty of God, uh, as is described, of course, in the Hebrew Bible as well as in the New Testament. So it is impossible to deal with the phenomenon of the Holocaust without in one way or another dealing with God. And that, I think, has to be true for Jews as well as Christians. Uh, the paradigmatic question on Jewish lips has, after the Holocaust, been where was God at Auschwitz? After having voiced this question myself many, many, many times, uh, in the course of, relic, of Holocaust related lectures. Uh, I was told on many occasions something that I mentioned last night. Uh, people told me, well, that's not the right question to ask. The more pertinent question, the correct question to ask is where was humanity at Auschwitz? Uh, absolutely correct. Uh, the question of humanity being absent from Auschwitz is a perfectly germane, correct question but in no way does it somehow eliminate the other question about God. Where was God at Auschwitz? Uh, that question has to be asked as well. It's an indispensable question, both for Jews as well as for Christians. Uh, often you know it is the poet who uh, expresses her empathy with uh, a question like, like this one, much better than professional theologians do. Uh, the, the professional theologians are very often armchair theologians when they talk about God. They are armchair experts on God, you might say. But when the poet, who has a greater sensitivity to what this question really contains and tries to convey, the question of where was God at Auschwitz, I think is, is quite well handled by the poet. And I, I would like to read you a little, exp well, a little poem, actually, from a 
poem from a poet that is very dear to me, Rainer Maria Rilke is his name. Uh, he had he lived uh, from the 19th into the 20th century. He died seven years before Hitler came to power in Germany, uh, and he expressed his uh, longing and his agony with regard to man's search for God in a beautiful poem, which is part of a collection of poems called Love Letters to God, actually. Uh, this poem is entitled Du Nachbar Gott in German. Uh, in English, you neighbor God or you God who live next doors. And it goes like this. I love this poem, by the way. It says, if at times through the long night I trouble you with my urgent knocking. This is why I hear you breathe so seldom. I know you are all alone in that room. If you should be thirsty, there's no one to get you a glass of water. I wait listening always. Please just give me a sign. I am right here. As it happens, the wall between us is very thin. Why wouldn't a cry from one of us break it down? It would crumble very easily. It would barely make a sound. That's the poem. Well, what becomes clear is that not only was the question asked in Auschwitz, it has been asked for centuries because of the seeming disappearance of the biblical, of the biblical God. So the question remains, where was God at Auschwitz. Uh, one could at this point probably relate and even analyze various philosophers and theologians' words dealing with the issues of evil, of suffering, that attempt uh, to explain or justify the relationship between God and evil. You know, theodicy, the word that I mentioned before, uh, is a sort of a discourse that promotes the plausibility of theism, whether in defensive or explanatory mode. And I could go through various uh, efforts at theodicy, beginning, you know, in ancient Greece with Epicurus, the great philosopher, and going through Plotinus and Philo, Philo and St. Augustine and Anselm and Aquinas. All these people dealt with this, this project, you might say. And in more recent uh, times, uh, I sort of appreciate the writings of Dorothy Sully, a, a German writer, and uh, Rosemary Ruther, two feminist theologians uh, who have written very, very important stuff, who really just, well, reject divine uh, omnipotence, but still somehow manage to hang on to the term divine which is something I can no longer do, as you will hear in a moment. And there, there's much sort of, for lack of a better expression, there's a sort of a lot of playing around with words in all these approaches. And uh, this is, of course, typical for armchair uh, theological approaches, all theoretical, of course. And often these theologians posit a premise and then develop with a absolutely rigorous logic, um, a system, and they arrive at a certain result. And the fallacy in many such undertakings is the flaw of the original premise, which very few, pe few people detect. Once that flaw is detected, you see, the resulting theological construct, so really magnificently constru constructed, collapses like a card house. The premise is wrong, the system is wrong. And so always when faced by such a theological argument, and I'm saying this primarily to our young people here who are in college, look at the premise very carefully and see whether it makes sense. And usually that can be detected, the truthfulness or the wrongness of the premise through common sense. Common sense is a great gift that is given to all of us which some of us unfortunately do not use. Uh, but hey, so it is. Many, many thinkers at this point in history, uh, and that includes myself, find theodicy distasteful. 
because in one way or another, it is artificial, it defies common sense that I just mentioned. Uh, I do not believe that God plans or permits horrible suffering for our good, for the good of humanity. That's out as far as I'm concerned. Tell the parents of a seven-year-old child that was shot to death that this horrible act contains a light which is hidden to us as was done very recently by a priest in the aftermath of the last uh, December shooting at Sandy Hook School in Newton, Connecticut. The child is now with God in a better world than the one we know down here. That's what the priest said to the parents. Now, I'm not making any kind of a value judgment here uh, on religion, on a denomination, or on that denomination's practitioners, far be it from me. Um, I thought that the rabbi of one of the dead children did have something better to say. And what he said was, when you see your wife today, give her a hug and tell her I love you. And when you see your child, hug him or her, give her a kiss and say to her, I love you. And when you do it, this is a wonderful moment in your life. Hey, we do not know what tomorrow will bring. That I think is the better response in that kind of a situation. So theodicy, thank you very much. I want no part of it. There's nothing good in murder. There's nothing good in drowning. Nothing will come of it. This cannot be in God's plan for any one of us. Common sense can tell us that we should not accept that explanation. Now, if I call myself a theologian, I am aware of the fact that I might be a poor theologian, a bad theologian, but definitely not an armchair theologian. That I'm not. And having been driven through seven slave labor and concentration camps uh, over a period of over three years, and having been bodily and spiritually accosted and violated and assaulted uh, in this terrible event, when I do theology, I want it with theology with feet on the ground and not up there floating around somewhere. Because I speak from experience. This is my experience, to be sure, and I'm not speaking for all the six million dead. I'm not speaking for all the other survivors uh, who are, of course, diminishing in numbers because of our age. I am 86, so you know that I don't have many, many more years before me. Uh, and yet, I think what I'm telling you is correct. After liberation, my major concern was rehabilitation uh, from the damage I had received during those terrible three years. And uh, my return to normalcy was only partially my accomplishment. Many decent and concerned women and men helped me reappropriate this kind of a basic humanity which I had lost during those three years. Uh, for many years, I wanted nothing more than to forget that chapter in my life. But you see, once I became a biblical scholar after I came to this country, I studied at Oberlin uh, College and got two master's degree in theology, New Testament theology in Greek, um, and uh, then another one in uh, biblical studies, and then later on a doctorate in France. After I became a biblical scholar and a theologian, the, the disciplines that I was in love with, you know, uh, forced me to rethink what I had experienced. And when I, in the 1960s, I think, maybe 1965 or so, read Elie Wiesel's book, Night. Who has read Night here? Wonderful. Good many of you. Proud of you. That book transported me back into my experience. My experience is embedded, or his experience is, is embedded in my experience. And all this brought back the Holocaust to my mind and the theological thinking about it. Uh, I began reflecting, speaking, writing on the subject, and it became clear to me that it was demanded of me to share my experiences 
with others and in so doing awaken in them a serious commitment not to let this kind of tragedy happen again. Well, that's why I'm here, of course. So reflecting and speaking and writing about the Holocaust for decades did bring me closer to an understanding of why and how this tragedy could have happened. Eventually, I concluded that the Holocaust was not, and I emphasize not, a unique event, a unique happening, contrary to what many scholars had said and have been writing. Um, well, to some extent, unique, yes, in terms of the number of persons murdered, in terms of how these people were murdered, I'm talking the methodology of killing here, but insisting on a qualitative difference uh, between mass murder or genocide, as we have come to call it. No, no. Mass murders happened before the Holocaust. They've happened, unfortunately, since the Holocaust. And unless something drastically is done, they will continue happening. That I learned from my experience. So I come back to God's silence now. I asked myself again and again, where was God at Auschwitz? And that question too yielded some answers, I think. I realized that God's absence from such tragedies was not unique either. God wasn't just absence from Auschwitz and nowhere else. There were other mass murders, as I mentioned, before and after Auschwitz. In our own time, I'm thinking of Rwanda, I'm thinking of Bosnia, I'm thinking of Uganda, I'm thinking of the Congo, I'm thinking of Somalia, and what's happening right now in Syria. All these are mass murders. All fresh in our minds. And I haven't mentioned natural disasters. I mentioned some of them last night. Uh, in natural disasters, in, in the last 14 years, 15 years, one million women and men have lost their lives. Where is God's omnipotence? Where is God's goodness? The biblical God's goodness. And then, uh, more recently, 20 little innocent children and seven adults cold-bloodedly shot by a 20-year-old madman in Newtown, Connecticut. So where was God not only in Auschwitz? Where was he? at Sandy Hook, Connecticut. Now, please, don't tell me that the biblical God, the creator and master of heaven and earth, and what is beneath the earth, uh, master of all that moves above, on, and below this earth, the omnipotent, the omnipresent, the all-knowing, the all-good, could not have saved 20 kids in Connecticut. That just does not make sense. So that's not where we want to leave the discussion. I would like to turn now for a little while, a few minutes, to post-biblical literature. I'm sure that most of you are not familiar with that literature. It goes usually under rabbinic literature. Uh, and one of its products is called the Mishnah and the Gemara, all together seen as the Talmud, a huge compendium of wisdom and practical rules for Jewish society, and hopefully for the rest of the world, perhaps, too, at least partially so. Well, I cannot deal in 45 minutes with this huge, volumin voluminous output of our sages who discussed literally every, every aspect of human life. Uh, some of it is anachronistic. Yeah, admit that, but some of it has great value. Uh, and this happened between the first century of the Common Era and the seventh century CE of the Common Era in the land of Israel and in Babylonia. And I want to share with you two Talmudic texts which have, which have helped me to, to deal with the God idea, which I really have come here to discuss with you. Uh, God idea vis-a-vis -vis human suffering. Now, before I do so, let me tell you very humbly that I hope no one in this audience will be offended by my words. My intention is simply to share with you my understanding of these two texts that I will present to you, which helped me personally 
in my search and longing for an understandable God, a God whom I can somehow deal with as far as my common sense is uh, related to all this. So this particular text comes from the Talmud, um, and um, it comes from a chapter in the, in the Talmud called Avodah Zarah, uh, 54b in this particular case, that's the reference, which means literally strange worship. Avodah Zarah means strange worship, but it's related to idol worship. That's the strangeness of it. And here's what it says. Uh, the first part, I, I will read to you all, all three uh, paragraphs here, but it's the two second paragraphs, the following paragraphs, that are of importance. Our rabbis taught, colon, philosophers asked our elders, Jewish elders in Rome, if your God has no desire for idolatry, why does he not abolish it? They, the elders, replied, if it was something the world has no need that were worshipped, he would abolish it. But people worship the sun, the moon, the stars, and the planets. Should he destroy the universe on account of fools? And then a little sentence is added, Ha'olam kemin ha'go noheg, the world pursues its natural course. That's the sentence I want you to remember. Back to the Talmud. Then there's a second question that is asked. Suppose a man stole, stole a measure of wheat and went and sowed it into the ground. It is right that it should not grow. Well, then there's an implied question there. So why does it grow? And the answer here is the same as above. Ha'olam kemin ha'gonoheg, the world pursues its natural course. And yet another question that the Talmud asks and then answers. Suppose a man has intercourse with his neighbor's wife. It is right that she should not conceive. The implied question, so why does she? And once again, the Talmud responds with the same words, ha'olam kemin ha'gonoheg, the world pursues its natural course. Now what do the sages mean by natural course? I do not think they think of astronomy, uh, galactic system movements, planetary movements. No, no, that's not what they think about. What these sages really do mean is that nature functions independently according to basic natural laws. When we plant something, hey, it'll grow. When a woman is inseminated, she will conceive. That's how Mother Earth functions. So the theological insight this teaching conveys, contains, conveys, is that God does not interfere in the Earth's natural laws. God does not micromanage the world in which we live. And that, believe me, is quite a thought departure, a rabbinic thought departure from, say, the Exodus narratives where we hear about the plagues in Egypt, and many, many others where God work, walks with Adam and Eve and he walks with me and he talks with me, etc., etc. So hand in hand with biological evolution, which we have come to understand, I hope, also goes intellectual evolution. And the rabbis observed and came to new conclusions and appropriated new insights and so expanded the intellectual horizon. But there is, most importantly, perhaps also and sort of ethics-related newness in this answer, namely the insight that nature and its laws are neutral, and they are unconcerned with morals and ethics. Categories of right and wrong, that's not nature's concern. These are the concern of human beings. Finally, last but not least, I want to introduce you to one more rabbinic text, and we'll talk about that very briefly. Uh, because it throws light, not only on the Holocaust, but on other catastrophes, large and small, that impact our humanity. And this text comes from a Midrash. It's called Midrash Tehillim, that is a Midrash commentary on the Psalms. 
And that's a commentary on Psalm 123. And uh, I was just absolutely blown away when I read this text. It's in Hebrew, giving you a little sample of Hebrew again. Which means in translation, when you are my witnesses, I am God. But when you are not my witnesses, I am not God. That's a pretty strong statement, folks. Now here, the existence of God is contingent upon us, human beings. This is, an, I think, an awesome thought. How can this be? You know, in the biblical narrative, God appears to Moses in the burning bush, names himself. I wonder whether the naming may not have occurred the other way around, namely we human beings having given names to God. And uh, a number of names, by the way. Uh, intuiting transcendentedness in our lives, something that exceeds our human understanding. So let me add that one of the earliest Jewish biblical commentaries, for instance, called uh, Bereshit Rabbah, Genesis Rabbah, commenting on the naming of the animals in Genesis. You all guys have read the Bible. I'm sure you've all read Genesis. God brings to Adam, who was just created, the animals and asks Adam to name the animals, whatever God whatever Adam names them, that they will be. Well, in this particular commentary, a very early rabbinic commentary, it is Adam who names the animals, just as Genesis suggests. But then God asks Adam, and what is your name? And Adam says, it is Adam. And God says, why Adam? Because I am made from Adama. I am made from the earth. Adama means earth. And then what is even more mind-blowing is that God asks Adam, and what is my name? And Adam says, your name is Adonai. Why Adonai? Adonai meaning Lord. Because you are the Lord of everything. So here, the biblical process in rabbinical thought is reversed. Adam makes these decisions. Adam calls himself Adam, and Adam names God as Adonai, and not the other way around. But I want to go to the New Testament, too, in, in this little development. You know that in the Gospel of John, we find the phrase, God is love. Now, I ask you, is it not true that we cannot define love as a noun, as we would define, say, a table, a flat piece of wood, four legs underneath, well, that's a table, is it not? Can you do that with the term love? No. The noun love is an abstraction. It's undefinable. Why? Because love is an act. It is an activity. Love pertains to loving, which is a verb. Love is something we do. Well, we can reflect about it, but the basis of love is doing love. It is a verb. Now, for Plato, the old philosopher, it may have been something up high and ideal, which can be discussed, of course, by human beings on Earth, who are we, us, trying to emulate this sort of thing, uh, very imperfectly so, by the way. But for us Jews and Christians, love is something we do. And so I came to the conclusion that love is doing. And so also I think it is with the concept of God. Concept of God as a noun. The concept does not become existentially real in our lives until we, in our humanity, with our humanity, begin caring, suffering alleviating, existence saving. There is no love. Noun. No. Until we love. Verb. And there's no justice until we do something justly. Do something justly. There's no compassion until we share in the suffering of others. Suffer with them. That's compassion. The 
linguistically, that's exactly what it means. And there's no forgiveness until we forgive a verb again. There is no God until we do Godness. Or is it goodness? And all these things we witness to. We create God, as it were, Kashem Kashatem Edai Ani El, when you are my witnesses, I am God. When you are not my witnesses, I am not God. Uh, is it not interesting to read both in our Jewish, in our Christian literature, that when two or three are gathered, there I am among you. You know that text, I'm sure. But is it not also true that we have to gather first? And gathering is a verb. In the story of the travelers to Emmaus, which is one of the most beautiful stories in the New Testament, I think, it is not until the act of breaking the bread together that the two pilgrims recognize the Christ. Right? That's what the text tells us. In Matthew 25, beginning with verse 31, the story of the judgment of the nations, it is not faith, which is a noun, in this or that, faith in this or that, that uh, is the important thing, but rather feeding, verb, the hungry, giving, verb, drink to the thirsty, welcoming, verb, the stranger, clothing, verb, the naked, visiting, verb, the sick, coming, verb, to the prisoners. These offer salvation. All these are acts. These are doing love. So as a Jew, I can say that Jesus, the Jew, incarnates, yes, incarnates the highest biblical values by means of actions, by doing things. Oh, we can discuss all this in idealistic terms as nouns, but it's the doing that brings reality down to earth among us. And when we live unconcerned for others, when we live in isolation from community and society, we cannot have relationships. That makes common sense, yet it is only and exclusively in a relationship that we are able to care and to save and to be compassionate and to alleviate suffering and to love. There must be a vis-a-vis -vis to do these things. And so without the other, we cannot witness. When you are not my witnesses, I am not God. Without witnesses, there is no God. In our synagogue in, in Asheville uh, that uh, Gail and I attend, uh, we have a Friday noon session. And we, are, we just recently read a book by Rabbi Harold Schulweis. Uh, that book is entitled, For Those Who Can't Believe. And he writes this, I like to quote him. We need to shift from God the noun to God the verb, to doing good. Faith in doing good horizontalizes the vertical view of the relationship between God and humanity. The same idea can be found in thought of the late Emmanuel Levinas, those of you guys who study philosophy may have run into that name, a brilliant French uh, contemporary uh, philosopher and theologian who died fairly recently. So in my opinion, then, in looking at the Holocaust as a whole and at Auschwitz as its representative in terms of a model of absolute evil, and that's exactly what it was, one can conclude that here, too, the world pursued its natural course, just as the Talmud states it. When hate against a certain people is taught as a virtue to be pursued long enough, it eventually will be practiced. And that is the way of the world, where there is no witness to goodness or godness, there also is no God. On the other hand, when you are my witnesses, I am God. And so where compassion and love were practiced, even at Auschwitz, there was also God, in my opinion. That means that even in the hell of Auschwitz, God was made present in certain situations between certain human beings. Let, let, let me just bring this before you that uh, occurs to me. 
you've, Auschwitz, you know, is mostly known for gassing the Jewish people and then for cremating them. Now, the, the gassing procedure has been described in many, many books, and it's absolutely horrible. And I cannot, for the love of, of God, uh, understand what may have happened there and how things were, took place. But I can imagine that in that most horrible of situations, when people realized that the end was near, a horrible end, that a husband would huddle in a corner with his wife, and maybe with his children, trying his best to somehow protect them. I can imagine where a mother would embrace her child, trying to protect them in those very last moments of life. And I think it is in those moments, in those most horrible of moments, that God was in Auschwitz. I have no question about that. I'm convinced because that is love. That is love in doing things, loving. And that's what God is, I think, all about. When you are my witness, I ask God, I'm God. So God is love. I agree with John. I agree with John, even though John is rather hostile to Jews the most hostile gospel, gospel there is in the New Testament, but there are a few sentences that John gets right in this Jew's opinion. Uh, God is love, and that means loving, and loving is an action verb. It makes God present, it makes God palpable, it makes God reachable, it makes God experienceable. Loving creates God. Perhaps God is much more than that. You know, I'm a human being. Hey. Who am I? I'm an ant compared to not just the earth, but all that surrounds the earth. I just recently heard that there are one billion trillion bodies out there in the sky. One billion trillion. So who am I? I'm nobody. So perhaps God is much more than that, that what I just recounted, what I just conveyed to you, I don't know. But you see, into that extra human sphere, I dare not enter, and I cannot enter. I will stick with the affirmation that God is not a noun, that God is primarily a verb, an act, and that the reality and presence of this God is brought about by us humans, which to me is a truly awesome discovery. And that is the God idea I can live with. That is the God idea which I love. That is the God idea which I cherish. And that is also the God idea with which I want to live, with which I want to bring about, bring about to happen in my life and in other people's lives. That basically is my God. Thank you. My hunch is that Dr. Ziffer has raised some questions, and I know that we're already uh, eating into the next hour. So I'm going to ask this. If you need to go ahead and leave, go ahead and leave, and we're going to wait just a minute or so uh, to let those who need to clear out, feel free to go do that now. Uh, but I, I really feel like we ought to give you an opportunity to, to field a question or two, if, if you're all right with that. Absolutely. So if you, if you want to stay for a moment, feel free to stay. If you need to, to move on, feel free to move on. That's what mom is all about. Yeah. Exactly. 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 And I wanted to mention this, but I didn't have it in my notes. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Okay. All right. Let's, um, if you will. Can we just get down yeah. Sure. Sure. Um, and I and I'm actually going to stay at the mic so I can hear the question and repeat it. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask, if you'd 
lift your hand, let me, let me see you, and I'll call on you, and then I'll, I'll speak the question, and then uh, Dr. Ziffer will, will make a response. Questions? Yes. In considering um, God and the way we live our life currently, how have you reflected upon what might come next when our lives on earth end in relation to how the vision of God is just described as earth and present and how we live now? And I'm going to go ahead and repeat that give you just a moment to no, My ears are not what they used to be. <laughs> <laughs> I have two little, little jobbies in my ear, but uh, real hearing ability is never really constructed by hearing. But my ears are not what they used to be. So, as you see, to all folks, I hope you get that all in order. So I, I, will re, I will repeat the question, uh, Mary. Uh, the question is, in light of what you've said, what does uh, your own thinking lead you to believe regarding what happens after this life? Is there any kind of life after this life? Is that a fair restatement? Okay. Well, you know, I'm a Jew, okay? And uh, I, I think I can say this, because one of our rabbis said right here, the second Jew. <laughs> I can say that Judaism does not uh, spend a lot of time on speculation on what follows. It, they really... Judaism really does. And of course, the Hebrew Bible, uh, with which you are familiar, I'm sure, does mean that there are a couple of, uh, couple of uh, references that I can mention, one in the book of Job, for instance, that makes some kind of a vague reference to a life uh, that uh, follows after. So in Judaism, I, I think we are much more uh, concentrating on life in the here and now. We have a guide uh, as to how to live in the here and now, and I'm thinking specifically, of course, of the Hebrew Bible, which non Jews usually call the Old Testament. We don't call that, uh, we don't give a different name for it. We call it Tanakh, the Torah, the prophets, and writings. And uh, as we concentrate on the here and now, we feel that if, if we live a decent life, then we really have nothing to worry about. What comes after a decent life, if there is anything at all, will be a continuation of that decent life, perhaps in some other forms, well, certainly in some other forms. But uh, there is no reflection on an after that. In certain uh, texts in the rabbinic uh, tradition, in the rabbinic literature, yes, there are some midrashim, these are stories, basically, that try to elucidate uh, biblical texts in some cases. Uh, but there is no emphasis on this. And so we Jews really, in that respect, do not worry uh, of what follows. Uh, I'm not sure whether I've said it all or not. But I personally am not, we not really are concentrating on this one. Now, as far as this life is concerned, you know, I don't have all that many years ahead of me, I'm sure. But unfortunately, probably because of my Holocaust experiences, I am more inclined to see the glass half empty than half full. Now, my wife is exactly the opposite. Uh, and that's why we complement each other very well, I think. Um, you know, we are slow learners. If people had learned something from the Holocaust and had accepted it, our life right now, our societal life, and we're talking about America necessarily, but what happens elsewhere could not happen. It would not happen. But we are, unfortunately, well, in the Christian tradition, would say sinful. And greed takes over. When we can profit from something, we step on other people's feet and use our elbows. And uh, that's, of course, not the Christian approach or the Jewish approach, needless to say, but there is this something in us. And uh, let me add to this, that in Judaism, we do not believe in original sin. I'm bringing this up because in Christianity, we would say it's original sin that, that gives us these, uh, this attraction to greed. 
Uh, we have what we call the Yetzirah Hatov, Yetzirah Ra, which means an inclination toward the good and an inclination toward the bad. Uh, and with that, every baby is born. We have no original sin. But it is our teachings, uh, I'm thinking of Torah, which is uh, the Pentateuch basically, but in some sense all of Jewish religious tradition, that tries to guide us toward Yetzirah Tov, toward the inclination toward the good. It's like scales, you know, that come out even. Now as we learn and absorb the good learning, then that side will go down, and the other side will go down. That's how we understand goodness and evil. And uh, unfortunately, it doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes the scales goes the other way. Uh, but the world pursues its normal way. You know, that's, that's what happens. My understanding right, is oh. that salvation for humanity lies in education. And uh, this is why I'm happy to be at Mercy. And I have been told by a friend up here about the project now, uh, Mercer on Mission. I highly appreciate that, that enterprise. And I think that's the way to go. And uh, that is Yetzer Hato. That's the inclination toward goodness that takes over. Godness, goodness, perhaps. Good, sorry for interrupting. Yes, question over here. Uh, Anya. You had mentioned that God is love and God is um, present and acts of love. Do you think that God is present in suffering? In other words, when somebody is suffering, is God with that person in some more intense way? Well, you know, that is the weakness in my system that you just put in here. You know, I, I made no plans for a perfect solution that I had. I don't think I could make it up there. But that is kind of a problem even with Auschwitz, you see. I talked about the mother who is trying to cradle the child, or the father who is uh, trying to protect uh, his partner. Uh, all of that, yes, that is love, because that's love in, right? And love in, as I said, creates God's presence. I have the same problem you have. What happens to the people who are alone there? Okay. I would hope that in a case like this, there is community okay, that takes care of it. And this is why I value uh, community more than anything else. In fact, if I'm a Jew, and not because of promises that I made in the Old Testament about God, because I'm there because of the community that I love, the people that I love, with whom I have a social intercourse and during a recent illness, for instance, of my wife, who had a very serious case of cancer, I could see the people coming together and helping us. That is community. That still doesn't answer your question. I realize that. And I can only hope that's all I can, that's how far as I can go, is that the thought of this does help people in whom are alone, who do not have the support of the community, have, that, that this thought helps those persons cope with the tragedy that, in which they are involved. Um, you know, my favorite philosopher is a Jew. His name is Spinoza. Uh, Spinoza didn't believe in God. Okay? But Spinoza, I like I said, the religion was important. He said that religion is important, in fact, because it creates community. But you cannot live as an island, right? Somebody wants to live the life sentence. Uh, you, you can't do that. You have to live as an island. To do anything, including, of course, most of all, love. So, it is a religious thought that we have in the Hebrew Bible or in the New Testament that would provide a solace to people who are beyond. Beyond that, I can remember because I don't know. I have a cancer survivor myself, but roughly 13 years ago. And 
caves. So I think what all this discussion should tell us is that when we see people who are alone, we should reach out to them and provide community for them. <coughs> because that's, I think, absolutely necessary. In good times as well as in bad times. I'd like to bring the glass of wine with a friend, and I like to discuss theology with a friend, but I also like to be there with a friend. Let me say thank you to Dr. Ziffer for uh, a stimulating lecture uh, and for a very warm presence among us. You have, you have actively uh, been loving among us, and we are grateful for that. Uh, he'll have an opportunity to stay around uh, towards the front here if you'd like to speak with him. Uh, thank you for coming and for being a part uh, of this time together. Thank you very much. Thank you.